Hi there, me again, Michael, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. So this Friday, I'm going to be doing the answers to comments and questions to get all that all updated and caught up. But today is yet again another Wordy Wednesday where we discuss aphasia, anomia, apraxia, uh, communication deficits and disorders after a stroke or a brain injury. And this week, we're going to cover a little bit about the caregivers um, and some of the strain and stress that get put on your friends, family, your loved ones, the people you live with, the people that you live your life with, uh, be that uh, close people at work, be that extremely close friends, be that uh, people that are in your family or live in your household. Because a stroke impacts so many people. Because the person that had the stroke or the brain injury, that'd be me, um, you don't live in a vacuum. Like, you don't live on an island. And unless, of course, you actually live on an island, but I'm speaking metaphorically, not geographically or topographically. Um, so, you don't live in isolation because you have relationships, some of them very meaningful, like the people you live with, people you trust, very close friends. Some of them are very kind of um, superficial, such as, you know, like, do you really have a, an extremely close relationship with your grocer? Uh, or or someone that works in a like a retail location like people that you you interact with on a regular basis but they don't really mean much to you so to speak so let's just discuss some of the difficulties that the caregivers for those of us that have aphasia again expressive or receptive in this event is irrelevant anomia again is irrelevant um, the apraxia again is irrelevant you have some form of communication deficit after a stroke a brain injury, concussion, something happened to your thinker, or maybe you were born with it. Um, and because there's been an insult or an injury to the thinker, unfortunately, uh, the word forming machine doesn't work so well. So let's just discuss some of that. Now, I've left resources down in the links below. Um, I've left one specifically for the province of Ontario because that's where I happen to live. So if you live in Ontario, um, not Ontario, California, but Ontario, Ontario, and Canada, the province of. Um, there's a, one of the links down below is for an Ontario resource. Uh, I found a University of Michigan PDF that was excellent. Um, and then there's some other documents as well posted down below. And again, as I find more resources, I will post them up. And eventually I will do a communication deficits um master inventory so we'll just do a video and i'll discuss each thing that i found and, and why i posted it so it'll make it easier for people looking for resources so let's just talk about a few things people that are around the person that has the communication deficit um, they exhibit depression and loneliness along with other emotional problems um, because you're a caregiver um, or a carer depending on where you live in the world um, you're health can decline, be that physical or mental, thus declining your ability to help care for the person that has the injury, and you start this kind of self-feeding circle. So that is one problem. There can be uh, incidents of role reversal in the relationship, and that's due to a couple of things. One, how prepared were you for this? Like. If you're not prepared, um, and this is something you can't really prepare for, it's it's not like you can go take a preparedness class at your local university or college or offered through like emergency management programs. Like this is something that you get thrust into. Um, it's kind of like a root canal. Like you can't really prepare for it. They're just going to do it and see what happens. Um, so... Now, what I mean by that is how strong of a relationship do you already have? How well do you already know that person? Um, uh, if there's already a healthy relationship. Now, again, this relationship between you and a good friend, you and, you know, someone from work, you and a loved one, you and someone you live with. You know, so how how strong is that relationship? How, how much um, emotional authenticity do you have in that relationship then you get into some of the other issues on the physicality of the relationship like how much 
of that person's time and energy do they need to physically use to take care of you? Like bathing, toileting, shopping, whatever. So that, that has some things in there. Then there's also mutuality, right? Uh, and basically how much do you share common values with that person? How much do you share common activities with that person? How much do you have shared interest, shared sense of humor, right? Again, these things um, draw us together as friends, uh, but they, what, they, they are what hold us together and, and binds us together in times of turmoil. So the people that share your sense of humor, the people that share your sense of values, your sense of interests, your hobbies, um, you know, that is the, you know, a good indicator that that relationship will be stable and that relationship will be sustaining through a highly negative event, such as a brain injury or stroke, a concussion. Other predictors <clears throat> could be poor health. Um, so if you ha already are of poor health, um, you may have difficulty sustaining a relationship. Uh, if you have other issues ongoing, uh, such as you have other caregiving duties or there is an absence of social support, again, that might be an indicator that things might not fare so well. So there's, there's basically those three factors can help determine how sustainable, how survivable, um, how realistic that relationship will be to you as a, uh, as a benefit um, to someone that has had an injury or for the person having had the injury, how much that relationship might be sustainable. So again, you can't really prepare for this, so to speak, in specifics, but if you've already got a healthy, stable relationship that where you share mutual interests, uh, where you know you can be emotionally authentic, um, you know, you stand a better chance uh, of of having um, a less of a negative time in dealing with this, because it is a negative. There are some some drastic negatives to having a communication deficit after a stroke or a brain injury. So. Some things you have to look at are, <clears throat> and again, this come, what I'm using now comes from the Michigan PDF. Um, basically, there's three phases to this. So there's the initial onset, meaning you're in the hospital, right? You then have um, the initial speech and language interventions, which is the start of your rehabilitation, and then there's your return to home. So each three of those is a change in a state of care. Um, now, in previous videos, <clears throat> I've defined a change in a state of care as either the change in physical location, meaning hospital to rehab or hospital to home or even unit to unit in a hospital, uh, or a change in state of ability. And, and when you have a change in a state of care, either physically or um, in ability, there are potentialities for post-stroke stress, uh, post-stroke anxiety, post-stroke depression. So you might want to seek some mental health help, right? So, and then there are some other, other things, such as what type of psychosocial support and counseling are there available to you? How complex is your aphasia or your anomia or your apraxia? Um, what type of emotional impact is that going to have on you and your loved ones? Because your loved ones want what is best for you. They want you to return back to where you were as if that event had never happened. Unfortunately, sometimes even the experts give you very expensive educated guesses. You're like, well, ah, six months, you'll be good. They really don't know. Like they're giving you from their experience, their judgment from previous cases they've seen, you know, they're, they're giving you benchmarks that sometimes might not be realistic and that's not their fault. That's just, the history of what they've seen and how things have progressed before. Um, you know, also there, there's a lot of sense of um, uncertainty and then hope uh, projected um, onto or from your caregivers because, you know, you get that phone call, hey, someone just had a stroke. You immediately run to the negative place. Like, oh God, they're hooked up to machines, they go ping and there's tubes and there's doctors, right? And then once you get through your initial rehab and then you get home, then the long-term kind of, I want to use the word, the word that comes to mind is ramifications, but that's not the right word. 
the long-term, again, consequences, not the right term, the long-term effects, like the long-term impacts, um, because there's no real ramification that you have aphasia, but you have aphasia. Um, so if you're a caregiver and you're watching this video, just got to remember a couple of things. One, you got to take time for yourself. Right? There's nothing wrong with you being selfish about you. And if you need to step away and take time, uh, this may require some extra logistical support. Like you might need to call like your local helping hands or some kind of um, service to come in and take care of your loved one. That is a possibility. Uh, it could be something as simple as hiring someone to clean your house. You know, like once every two weeks, you pay someone 60 bucks, they come in and they clean your house or whatever the case may be. Um, some of that also could be go in an exercise class, go take a walk. Um, I would strongly suggest go to some form of counseling support, uh, be that in a group or be that one-on-one, -on -one, what have you. You want to connect with others in your situation, so you might want to go to a peer support group. Uh, again, because you get to hear the experiences of other people and you may learn what works for other people, may or may not work for you, right? Next one, don't make everything about aphasia or whatever. Apraxia, anomia. Um, just like a teacher, when a teacher gets done their day, they they don't they technically are still a teacher, but they're not going to be a teacher in their home, right? Obviously, you're going to correct major faux pas, uh, but you can't correct everything every time. And being the guy that's got the aphasias, that'd be grinding. That'd just be grinding. Like no, you know. <laughs> Commit to a certain period of time at home where you have the correct communication, right? Where everything gets corrected and you're looking at grammar and syntax and word choice. And then just forget about it. Just go about your day. And if I can't say T, I'm probably going to go, uh, 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 you know, and you'll figure it out. So don't try to correct everything because that's just going to create resentment and people are going to burn out, right? And then going along with don't make everything about aphasia and make time about yourself, don't worry about what you can't control. If it's not in your physical ability to influence the outcome of that event, who cares? <clears throat> who cares? Right? If you try to create um, the manufactured kind of sensation that I can control everything, well, one, you're going to get frustrated because, A, you can't. B, you're going to become resentful because you can't. And then C, everything is going to collapse around you because you're wondering why you can't control the things you can't control and why people aren't doing what you want because you can't control them. So don't do that. <clears throat> try to see what you have the ability to influence try to see where you have the ability to provide information but just remember it truly is the lead the horse to water argument i can bring you to the source of information i can provide you all the advice and insight that you would need to successfully interact with me being someone with aphasia and then it's up to you and, and if you choose to ignore everything I've said, and if you choose to just do what you think is right, well, that's not my fault, and I can't control that. I can control choosing to remaining engaged with you, and then just walk away, right? So whatever you can control, you can control. Whatever you can't, you can't. And whatever you can influence, and you can, you can inform, you know, you can try to help shape the situation, yeah, but you can't control it, right? Educate yourself and help create a plan about your next steps. Not your loved one's next steps, but yours, right? Because just because your loved one has aphasia doesn't mean your life magically goes on hold. Um, now, you can help create a plan with your loved one about kind of the next steps for them over the next six months, 12 months, and, 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 and forward and forward and forward. But you yourself need a plan, right? So does that mean... Um, you are going to maybe go to aphasia camp because there are camps for people with aphasia or you're going to volunteer with your local aphasia association or 
you're going to, you know, you and your loved one are going to go to couples counseling or you and your loved one are going to go to speech and language together once every couple of weeks or, or you're just going to get out and join like a competitive Euchre club or bridge club down at the local organization, right? Something that it gets you out, um, gets you active in your community, helps use your educational or not educational, but your, um, your uh, communication skills. And maybe you have to educate others around you, but so be it. And then part of that making a plan is you don't have to plan A for everything. You don't have to plan B for everyone. And then C, your plan doesn't even have to be anything longer than a couple of months. Like there's no reason why you have to have, it's a good communist five-year plan. You don't have to do that. Like we're not talking plan the rest of your life. Um, I'm talking about the strategies you're going to use to help improve um, uh, success with the, the rehabilitation at home. And then lastly, get help. Go out, get help. So be that marriage counseling, be that individual counseling, be that going to a support group, be that, you know, joining a group that has nothing to do with aphasia, like you join a book club or a murder mystery club or whatever, right? Um, could be getting someone, like I said before, to clean your house for you. Could be so many things, but go and find an outlet for you that is uh, therapeutic, that has some benefit, um, that may be formal and structured, may be informal and non-structured. Something that gives you benefit, something that allows you an outlet um, so that you're not cloistered all the time and, and, and feel like you've got to like put your life on hold because my communication skills may be on hold situationally and, and that happens my my ability to communicate out to the world may may be on hold at times that's my problem right that's not yours now my girlfriend I know it stresses her out at times when I have some difficulties and I know it causes you know angst but and we'll get into people that are like um, highly um, disrupted in another video. Uh, but just because your loved one is dealing with the pitfalls and the stumbles of a communication deficit doesn't mean that your life has to cease. Right? You are still entitled to fulfillment and you're still entitled to um, do things that you enjoy. And just because it takes me an extra three minutes to order a hamburger or a, a, a steak sandwich, that, that's no one's fault, right? So on that note, this has been another Wordy Wednesday. This one has been on um, caregivers and some of the difficulties they go through. Uh, next week, we're going to cover caregivers and caregiver mental health specifically. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that. This one's more of kind of a, an introductory kind of what resources might be out there for you. So if you like what you've been watching over the last... Um, well, a little over uh, almost 20 months, please like, share, subscribe. If you know someone that is currently going through the recovery from a stroke, uh, currently has a communication deficit, or someone that is a caregiver or someone supporting someone after a stroke or a brain injury and has a communication deficit, please like the channel out to them, like, share, subscribe. And they have to, if you happen to see someone around you that it looks or appears like they're having a stroke, including you, things that someone immediately appears befuddled or confused or has lost their sense of balance. Someone who has vision problems, they can't see to one eye, they only see in grayscale, they can't move their eyes in a certain direction, they see a little dot in the world. Someone who has facial droop, there's a noticeable visual slackening of the facial muscles. Someone who can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. Someone who can't smile equally effectively or at all. Someone has slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate use of language for situation or context, or you can't understand language. Um, uh, someone who has general body weakness, weakness on one side, or has the inability to stand unaided, please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.